welcome our guests here today again. I know that uh, this gentleman back here is from Eustis, Florida. You got, you got a family Bible down there? Yes. Oh, amen, from Alan Spiegel's church. They're visiting where? In Cheyenne right now? Is that where you are? Cheyenne, yes. Oh, good to have you here, Paul. Praise God. And the gentleman that was over here left. <laughs> Took his, huh? Took the kids out. Took the kids out. I'm going to say, sometimes, what was that? Steve. Yeah, Steve. I met Steve. Uh, sometimes it doesn't take me that long to offend people, so I thought maybe he already... <laughs> Did you hear a car starting out there? <laughs> Praise God. We've had a really, really, really busy week, a prosperously busy week, a good busy week, obviously, with all the work that we've been doing. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, having the, uh, the, the wonderful interjection of, uh, of a baby being added to the family. And it's, so it's been a busy week with not a lot of rest at times, but it's very, really been good. And we're excited about the. Uh, I have great expectations going forward. You know, I believe that uh, if you're listening to God, you have great expectations going forward. And I, I guess what I just said was, if you don't have great expectations, you're not listening to God. See how you just flip something over and you can just turn it from grace to condemnation without almost any trouble at all. <laughs> I didn't mean it to sound that way, but it did. Amen. I'm going to kind of start into something new today and uh, another not uh, never new around here, but you know what I mean. And uh, but and because the week has been so busy, I'm going to stick pretty close to my nose because I want to make sure that I say things accurately. And and um, but, you know, have you ever um, you know, do you ever wonder, do you ever wonder how someone got what they got or heard what they heard out of something you said? Yeah. Do you ever wonder about that? Yeah. Husbands and wives. <laughs> yeah. Do we ever wonder, you know, this is a this is a major this is a major uh, point of contention at times in our home we uh, we wonder how the other one heard what they heard out of what we said and you know and of course the stresses of life and all the busyness and stuff add to the potential for that you know but but you know but did it ever occur to you that uh you know that that other people wonder the same thing about you how did he or she get what i said get get that out of what i said right you know well you know i i read you know uh, some of the good posts on facebook I'm not a real big Facebook Facebook person, but I, I read some of those and, and I, I read good posts. And then later on, I, I read some of the opposing posts. And and I and I honestly have to wonder where in the world did they get that in response to what this person posted? What did they hear? How did they possibly hear what they're suggesting in what this person posted? You know what I'm saying? I have to ask that sometimes. You know, I think I've told you this before. Thirty nine years ago, I had a, a Bible with wide enough margins that it was able to contain all of my educated thoughts and all my <laughs> irrefutable doctrines on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, my reasonings were contained in the my reasonings for excluding the baptism of the Holy Spirit from 20th century church experience. Right. Were, were clearly documented in the margin of that Bible. Right. And then at a later point, you know, about 37 years ago, I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And after I did, and I went back and I read those things, because you've heard me say this before, but all of those documentations that were in the, the wide margin of that Bible, which I had purchased specifically for that purpose. I don't know if there was anything written in the margins about anything else anywhere. I had purchased it specifically at the old Fort Collins Bible House that eventually became the superstore. But I went in looking for a Bible with wide margins because I wanted to document my irrefutable <laughs> doctrine. You know, I wanted to write down my educated, you know, thoughts, right? My reasonings. And I went back after I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I looked at the, the scriptures that I had circled and and the the lines that were drawn to the to the uh, margin of my bible and i looked at those things and i thought to myself how did i get that out of that what did i hear see what i'm saying which which really is an indication of the fact that our experience with god keeping it on a on a uh, spiritual plane right now our experience with god changes the way we hear things and see things it enables us, the deeper, uh, you know, the, uh, I, deeper, I don't like that word. That sounds like we're, uh, you know, placing ourselves in a different place. I don't mean that. But, 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 but the, the further into the revelation of God's love and grace we go, you know, the more it changes the way we see things that we used to see so clearly. You know what I'm saying? And this, I believe, is the case of what's taking place. And again, I, I'm not really, 
here to preach about Facebook. Facebook has just brought this thing to light. Because when I go on, and, I, and I'm, not a, I'm not a blogger, I'm not a, a, you know, a keyboardist, you know, and, so I, and I just really don't feel like telling people what I think on, in that, you know, down there. It takes too much time. I'd rather stand up here and talk for two and a half hours. That doesn't take as much time. It takes me much longer to write it. But I, but I also think that God must feel the same way about us. He must think, look down, and, and he must say, look at Jesus and look at the Holy Spirit and say, how did they get that out of what I said? What do you think they heard, son? You have any ideas, Holy Spirit? <laughs> and they all just shake their, you know, their corporate head together. Not a clue. Well, you know, I want you to go with me this morning to Isaiah chapter 1, first of all. And I want to talk about, you know, I'm, I'm calling this message this morning, God's thoughts within us. And as I can say, we're kind of breaking ground on a new penetration I want to make into our into our understanding of some things but <clears throat> Isaiah 118 and most of us are probably familiar with this verse but not necessarily in the context in which I'm going to speak it come now and let us reason together says the Lord and that's what I'm going to focus on and of course it goes on and though your sins are like scarlet they shall be white as snow they though they are red like crimson they shall be as wool he says come now and let us reason together all right now let me ask you do you know what that means <laughs> here's what that means come now let us reason together you know what if, if, if Marilyn and i sit down and we're going to reason together it means something entirely different than what this means because when we're going to reason together it implies that we're both going to have some input into the issue okay but here's what this means when it says come now let us reason together it means that you come and he's going to tell you what he meant when he said what he did. Make sense to you? In, 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 in other words, you know, <laughs> he is not going to ask you what you think about his plan. Right? He's not going to say, well, now, Mike, how would you interpret this? How would you, you see? He's I'm going to tell you what I meant when I said what I did. So this come now, let us reason together involves you with regard to being willing to come. Say, but then you need to understand that when you come, he's going to tell you what he meant when he said what he did. Okay? All right. Now, in verse 19, he goes on. And this new King James says, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you are willing and obedient. Now, what's he referring to? Well, now, he's referring back to the first part of that. He's referring to the fact, he's saying, If you're willing to come so that we might reason together. And then he says... This verse says, and obedient. Here's an interesting thing. This word that is translated obedient here occurs about 1,200 times in the, in, the, in the Old Testament scriptures, and only eight times is it translated obedient, which tells me that probably this was one of the choices of the legalistic translators to communicate something to you that they felt like you needed to hear. You're only going to be blessed. You're only going to eat the good of the land if you're obedient. But listen to this. This word otherwise is translated 785 times here. Just here. 196 times hearken. So nearly 1,000 times this word refers to hearing and hearkening to what you hear. Okay? Now, you can plug obedient into that if you understand it in that light. But you see, it's been communicating something differently. So here's what's being said. He's saying, if, we'll, if we're willing to reason with him, if we'll hear and hearken to his reasoning, then we'll experience the good that he's prepared for us. But if we are only willing, ladies and gentlemen, to reason with our traditions, to reason among ourselves, you know, among our peers, you know, pastor to pastor, minister to minister within the same denominational group or within, within the same, you know, uh, understanding of Scripture. If we're only willing to reason at that level, see, that's going to keep us bound to a lower experience. We're not going to eat the good of the land. The good of the land is for those who are willing to come and hear what the Father has to say about what He meant when He said what He did. See what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm not going to be try to be critical or, or, or to crucify anybody because I understand that, that we are all at different places, or, 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 you know, for the most part, in, in our growth experience, in our understanding, and so on and so forth. But I'm telling you what, people, I just have to look at some of those 
those uh, I guess maybe I'm kind of defending those that right now that who, whose posts I agree with. That's probably what it sounds like. But but I look at some of that and I think that is the stupidest thing that that person could have said in opposition to that post. I think that is just plain stupid. And you're a pastor of a church. You're a pastor of a large church. You're a, you know, and I just want to go off on them. And that's why I don't type anything, because then I would <laughs> offend a whole lot more people than I do just locally. See? But anyway, go with me over to Isaiah chapter 55. You think, man, we're moving along fast. We're already on his second scripture, and he only has four. Don't be fooled. Judge not by the appearance of things, but judge with righteous judgment. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Again, these are passages of Scripture that we're all textually familiar with. All right? But here, what I want to ask you as we read this is, are you aware of the present potential reality of this in your life? Because they just, let's read it, okay? For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As again, like I said, we're all familiar with that. But do we ever stop and consider that maybe that could be speaking to us, you know, today? Now, this isn't intended to establish an impasse where, you know, his thoughts can't become your thoughts. That's not what he's communicating. He's not saying this is the way it will always be. My thoughts will always be higher than your thoughts. My ways. Are... No, he's saying, you know, you can tune into my thoughts because you have the mind of Christ. See what I'm saying? And, and I do speak within you. The spirit himself beareth witness that we are the children of God. You see what I'm saying? So he's not telling us that we can't know the thoughts and the ways of God. He's just making, you know, a statement here to remind us once again, 54 chapters later, come now, let us reason together. If you're willing and, and, and you'll hear and hearken, you'll enjoy the good of the land. And that's what I really want for you. See? So, you know, I just put this out here because, you know, we've, we've been talking about some things around here. You know, all of us have, all of us that have been ministering the word here, and even those of you that haven't been ministering the word publicly here, you've been talking about it as well. The church is in reformation, whether some like it or not. And sadly, there are some of our peers, and again, when I say peers, I'm just speaking of people who identify themselves even as grace preachers, you know, as people with a message of grace. But there are some among us. Uh, not necessarily in this church, who, who, would, who disagree, who disagree, who don't like the fact that we're saying that the church is in reformation. And there are many who like it, right? Now, in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 16, 9, Paul said this. Paul says, a great and effective door has opened to us. Isn't that exciting? Oh, I wish he stopped there. And many adversaries. Oh, phooey. I want it to be easy. A great and effective door has opened to us and many adversaries, right? Well, here's the thing. You know, in, in this reformation that I'm talking about, you know, God's thoughts and ways are entering once again into the hearts of men and women who are willing and hearing. God's thoughts. See, because God speaks to his children, not just to, not to his pastors, not to his apostles and prophets and evangelists and teachers. God speaks to his children. See? And, and God speaks to every man. My sheep hear my voice. Not my, you know, not my lead sheep or my or my shepherd. Or, he said, my sheep hear my voice. Right. And so his thoughts and his ways are coming into the into the hearts once again, being heard in the hearts of those, you know. And, uh, but, but sadly, adversarial thoughts are also abounding, now listen to me carefully, in the hearts of many truly good men. Now, I have been told recently by one of my dearest friends that he doesn't agree with the stuff that I'm teaching, a minister of the gospel. He gave me several points that he does not agree with the things that I teach in this church. Now, adversarial does not mean that he was ugly with me. He wasn't ugly. We had a wonderful conversation together. We intend to play golf together at a later time. You see, we had a wonderful conversation. He's someone I'll always love. And yet adversarial in the fact that these things that he has to say are, are, are offered to try to, not in his own mind thinking, but to try to divert me from the voice that I'm hearing. You understand what I'm saying? Now, the thoughts and reasonings that are, that are coming into the, uh, into the hearts of people that are listening now, the, the new thoughts and, and reasons that are, that are surfacing, they aren't really new. 
They're really just things that have been, for the most part, suppressed for the last 19 centuries because of the emphasis of legalism in the church. They were the first century way of thinking. They were the first century tools of of interpretation. They were the first century's conceptual tools. See? And, And now what's happening is there are people like me, like many, okay, that are discontent with the, with the present day ministry, present day message. Not discontent in an ugly way. I'm not mad at people who preach the other message or a different message, but discontent. I want the message to be a message that is productive, fruitful, viable in the life of every person that I'm going to speak to. And you see, my heart has been for years, Father God, help me say this message, per, per, speak a message that will produce positive life change in the, in, in the hearts of people, that will encourage them, that will exhort them, that will bring about your finished work and manifestation in their life. That's my desire, folks. That's all I've ever cared about. Marilyn can bear witness to that, you see. But anyway, so but, but as I said, you know, they're, they're being, these things are being heard in the hearts of men who are rightly dissatisfied and who are at the same time humbly inquisitive. Humbly. You know, you see, we can, we can do like the hippie movement, question authority, and have it kind of be in a negative connotation on that. And yet that was a good, that back then during Vietnam, that was a good, uh, that was a good statement, question authority. There, there needed to be some questions asked as, as to why we were involved in things like that that were turning, to be, turning into illegal wars and theft and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, there needed to be some questions asked, but they needed to be asked by people with humble hearts and in a position to make change. See what I'm saying? And that's what I believe has to happen. Because I want you to understand, you know, as I said, there are, there, there are many that are dissatisfied. And again, I said there were many adversaries, but there are also many who are dissatisfied who are inquiring of God. And these new thoughts, many, Francois Dutoy, Arthur Mencius, Joseph Prince, say, Bertie Britz, Mike Miller, Caleb Miller, John Dunlap, say, uh, who's going to be here in September? <laughs> Baxter Kruger, John Crowder. And I know some of these guys are, you know, maybe a little bit too weird for you. Some of them not weird enough, you know. <laughs> Can't be too weird for me. See, I like weird when it pushes the envelope. You know what I'm saying? Pushes the envelope not because I want people to be pushed into a corner where they embrace something that is not valid, but because I want people to be pushed to the point where they begin to think for themselves. Because the church has been thinking for people too long. And that's why the body of Christ is in the condition they're in. And that's why the world is in the condition they're in. Because the church has never been in a place to tell them the truth. We've been lying to the world for 20, 19 centuries. That's devastating, right? So we're many as well. So the adversarial voices are many. But so are the our voices. And, uh, there, there's, there's fellows that on Facebook, you might see, uh, was it Benjamin Conroy and, and Brian Alexander? And there's di- di- different people I read, and I think, you know, that guy's listening to God. Not because he agrees with me. Some of them are saying things, and I'm having to say, wow, do I believe with that or not? But you know what? I like people that challenge me, too. I don't just turn them off because they do that. So anyway, I'm just kind of... Like I said, getting started into something. But now some of us, and Arthur and I talk about this, uh, you know, some of us in the Grace Awakening have been accused of making Scripture say what we need it to say in order to, uh, you know, validate our message. And, you know, sadly, the, the people that, you know, people accuse us of that, and that's actually how the prevailing negative doctrines Amen. found their way into the church. Is by people making Scripture say what they needed it to say in order to control people. In order to exercise more legalistic dominion over people, they made Scripture say. And so after 1,900 years of that, give or take a few years, you know, we've become convinced that these Scriptures mean just exactly what the Scriptures meant to me when I didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But what's actually happening... So I said, you know, we've been accused of making something out of nothing. I hope we are, because I'll tell you what, for the most part, a big part of Christianity has amounted to nothing in its experiential value to people. And so I hope we are making something out of nothing, something living and active, something powerful and wonderful. I know that's what this is in my life. I mean, this is this is Marilyn and I's life to the bone. Even when we don't get along, we, we agree on the word. 
Yeah. She calls me a know-it-all, and I tell her, I know the Scripture says I know all things. (laughs) See, we agree on the Word, even when we're not getting along. But what's actually happening is, in our dissatisfaction and in our humble inquisition, and I'm not trying to establish myself as a man of great humility, I don't mean that, but my, 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 my inquisitions before the Lord are in humility. I don't always display that here, but I'm, <laughs> but here's what's actually happening. We're being presented by the Holy Spirit with, and if you'll allow me, I'm going to quote T.F. Torrance here, but it, we're, we're being presented by the Holy Spirit with basic clues that have created in us anticipation of insight into the true pattern of things. Now, I said we're being accused of making something out of nothing or of, or of making Scripture say what we need it to say in order to support our message. Well, what's happened is there have been some basic clues that have been released in our life by the Holy Spirit only because we're asking not so that we can be more popular or more well-known than some other teacher, but so that we can minister life to the body of Christ and to the world around. We're asking questions, you know, of the Lord. And, and what's happened is he's, he's revealing to us basic clues, if you will. It's like T.F. Torrance says here that have created in us anticipation of insight into the true pattern of things. Or in other words, to say it like this, we now anticipate, I know Arthur does, Caleb does, John does, I do, Bertie does. I mean, people, when, when, we, you know, when we get into the Word, we have an anticipation that we didn't necessarily have before when we were content in the message that we were, that we were living powerlessly in. See? I remember when I first found, you know, I had no idea there were more than two scriptures in the whole Bible on healing when, when Michelle was healed in 1975. And I got into the scriptures and began to write out the scriptures that pertain to healing. My gosh, t- three notebooks later, I was still writing. See what I'm saying? Because what happened was I began to see scriptures that I had read before, but now I had an anticipation of finding, an expectation of finding the healing love of God revealed in scriptures that before hadn't, I hadn't seen anything in. And so that's what's happening now. So we now anticipate the uncovering of suppressed revelation because of certain foundational concepts that have resurfaced and shown themselves to be undeniable truths. There are certain things. Arthur preached here several months ago, a few months ago, you know, on foundational truths. And some of those foundational truths have been overlooked, have been, you know, his, 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 he taught on a foundational truth here in the, uh, in, the, in the conference, you know, on the fact that God created us, he's human, that he's for our humanity, that our humanity is God-ordained, and it's, you know, as I'm saying, you, you need to go listen to that. What an awesome revelation to most people who have been told your humanity is bad. You want to turn your back on that, on the, on the humanness of man. Well, if you do, you're turning your back on the plan of God, see? But anyway, so there's some basic clues, as T.F. Torrance says, you know, that have, that have been revealed to, to those who are just willing to come and reason with God. Not because we have greater educational skills or anything. I mean, you know, because we really don't. Most of us, I'm finding out, very few of us, there's a couple of exceptions, Baxter Kruger and maybe some of these other fellows I've spoken that I don't know, who, who have, uh, I have no university background, no theological seminary background, any of that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, I did go to college a little bit, but it wasn't for that. It was for coaching, you know. So, um, but anyway, as I said, we're anticipating things. And, you know, if you don't have an expectation, you won't find. If you anticipate going into the Scripture and finding, you know, what you must do in order to be blessed, I'm telling you, folks, you'll find it. That's apparently what the translators were were anticipating when they got to uh, Isaiah 119. If you're willing and obedient. You'll eat the fat of the land. See? They were anticipating something, and so they plugged it in there. Well, we've got to have some kind of an anticipatory experience. And, and, and so that's, that's really what's happening. So, and, and consequently, because of that, and I'm going to quote T.F. Torrance again here for a moment. And this is out of a book called The Mediation of Christ. And I've just taken some ideas, some things. He's not necessarily speaking exactly to what I'm speaking to today. But as I read this, it just really... Because I've been saying, you know, I've said it here in church a couple times, mostly on Wednesday night. Where do people get the things they're... Why are they responding to these obvious truths with such negative opposition? See, good people. I mean, people that I would normally say... I want to listen to this guy's CDs. I want to I want to listen to this woman's teaching, you know. And then I see this and I'm thinking, where are they coming from? So I'm asking that question and I think the Lord kind of opened up my understanding with some of these things and that's why I'm quoting this man here. But 
So consequently, I said, we've begun because we've now have this anticipation of uncovering, you know, some of this suppressed revelation. You know, we've begun reexamining and reinterpreting all of the data, putting them together under the guidance of the basic insight, that basic insight that we've discovered. And we're going to be talking about that next week and weeks on, you know, some of these basic insights. Okay, but reinterpreting all the data, putting them together under the guidance of the basic insight we've discovered. Until the coherent pattern comes clearly in view. Once the insight has put us on the track of that discovery, something irreversible has taken place in our understanding. Most of you that have experienced consistently healing, for instance, will realize you plug that into here. Something irreversible happens to your understanding once you find out, see, the truth about the health of the, you know, the health that's been provided for. Something irreversible has taken place in our understanding. A pattern of truth has been built into our minds until we can't go back and we can't deny what we have experienced. Isn't that right? And, and that's what's happening. And again, this is not to put people down. This is to maybe encourage us maybe to be speaking to those people Go, reason with the Father. Don't reason with me. Don't try to reason with me on Facebook. Go reason with the Father. Go listen to the Father, see? So, yes, you know, it's it's true that we are seeing things that support the message that we preach. We are making Scripture say what we need it to say, but it's because we are finding valid truths expressed there that do validate the message. That makes sense to you? Because something has happened. I remember when Mar- after Michelle was healed and we began to study and Don's arm, Don broke her arm running to school one morning, was healed in an hour and a half. We just had different things happening, you know, back in the 70s. And, and, and you know, and I began to study the scripture because I wanted to find out. And I remember that the, the people at the church we were attending at the time, that there was just, there was at that time not a voice in the crowd that agreed with me that healing was the will of God. Always the will of God. And you know what? It's like Andrew said, you know, don't wake me. Well, I had the same thing, you know. I've already been spoiled. It's not going to make any... You can't put a doctrine in my face that's going to change what happened to my daughters, to my sons, to my children. You you can't... There's no doctrine that will replace that. It's irreversible. See what I'm saying? I can't deny it. Now, I can refine it. I can understand it better. I can can open myself up to the Lord to to make a fuller thing out of it. But I can't go back. All right? Go with me over to Matthew chapter 17. Wow, he's on the third scripture already. I'm tasting that hamburger already. Mm -mm. Man, you better get out your (laughs) patience pills here. Anyway. So again, I want to just say, I mean, I'm not denying. I, I do make scripture say what I need it to say. But I only use scriptures that actually say what you need to hear. See what I'm saying? I don't take some obscure scripture and make it say something that it's not supposed to say. <clears throat> All right, Matthew 17, 1 to 8. Now, most of you have heard me teach out of this in the past in, in, in one of my, I don't know, series that I did. But now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. I read that quickly. Most of you are familiar with it. But let, let's just remind ourselves, and for, the, you know, for, the, uh, for those of you that haven't heard this before, you know, what we find here on the Mount of Transfiguration is, is, is Moses, who's the, per, the representation of the law, Elijah, who's the representation, the epitome of the prophet, and Jesus, the gospel. So we see the law, the prophets, and the gospel all here gathered together and immediately peter's thought is the is the religious thought of today still the prevalent thought let's build three tabernacles let's embrace the law the prophets and the gospel let's mix it all together let's preach it all let's be bible preachers and while he was still speaking god said 
shut up. That's what he said. That's what I read. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed. See, we have this three tabernacle theology that's prevalent in the church. And not, is it, not only is it prevalent in the, in the church, but many good men still have it in their hearts. They can't quite tear away from it. They may be preaching grace from their pulpits, but in their hearts, they still struggle with this three tabernacle or this, you know, this three tabernacle theology. It's difficult. We've got to embrace a little bit of the law in order for us to live right. Now, we know that the law won't cause us to be righteous before God, but we need to look to the law for instruction on right living. You know what? I don't have to look to the law to know not to commit adultery. And the grace of God makes me love my wife. Not makes me. I want to. But I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I get to love my wife. I don't have to love my wife. I mean, all of these things that people say just don't make any sense if you play them out a little longer, right? But anyhow, so th- but this whole passage here, so, so the, he, uh, he, while he is still speaking, it says, Peter, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Right? Hear him. Okay? So, so here's a prime example of God reasoning together with men. They were gathered together. They had come now with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration, hadn't they? And so now they're in a prime place for God to reason together with them, to tell him what he meant when he said what he did. And so he did. This is my beloved son. Hear him. So this is a prime example, see, of God, you know, uh, introducing new thoughts, some God thoughts and God ways into the hearts of these three fellows, Peter, James, and John. All right? Now, these were basic clues, as T.F. Torrance said, basic clues that would eventually, it didn't happen overnight, folks. You know that. If you read Galatians, you know it didn't happen overnight with Peter. But these were basic clues that would eventually lead these guys to reexamine their tradition and reinterpret their experience with God. See, God was planting some basic clues. Now, I want you to consider these three fellows for just a minute, okay? Five minutes ago, they were law and prophets to the bone, Right? Just five minutes ago. I mean, they just walked up the mountain, going to have this glorious day with Jesus. On the, maybe we'll have a picnic lunch, you know. Maybe, maybe we'll throw a little Frisbee after he does whatever he's up here for, you know. Good day. Law and prophet folks to the bone. And now five minutes later, they're stripped of everything but Jesus only. And that's what it's all about, folks. Jesus only. What he did. What he did. Not what you do. What he did. Hear him. Hear what he did. Hear what he was all about. Hear who he became and who you became because of who he became. See? It's all about Jesus only, right? Well, now listen. So, so here these guys got this new revelation. And I got to tell you, they wouldn't have lasted one day on Facebook. <laughs> Peter would have gone on the next morning and he would have said, Listen, what I found out, it's not about the law and the prophets. It's about Jesus only. And the first response that would have come back to him was saying, are you suggesting everyone is going to heaven? (laughs) Huh? How did you get that out of, I said, it's not about Moses and Elijah, it's about Jesus only. That's the stupidity I keep reading on Facebook. People make revelatory statements that make perfect sense, not just to me, but sometimes they don't make sense to me, but I mean, as I follow them through, I realize they're right, you know? And somebody comes back, are you saying that everybody's going to heaven? What in the hell did that have to do with, with what, I, what they said? Pardon me, but they, you know, I've got to say that, folks. I can't understand where they get that stuff. Anyway, so they'd have both been, you know, they'd all three been defriended and blocked right away. You know, that'd been it. Wouldn't have been able to get a message through to them. Okay. But what God did here was, you know, God introduced some new tools for concept development. These guys were in a very early stage of change. You know, they were just being introduced to some things right here. Very first thing. I mean, here they are, law and prophet guys. And now they're being sold. Now, not Moses, not Elijah, him only. Right. So they're brand new. So they've got to have some conceptual tools given to them. Something to. And again, I'm using T.F. Torrance's words. I like the way that tools for developing concepts. You know, 
So he's introducing them to some new tools, you know, appropriate methods of thought and speech that would set them on a path to accurate discovery. Right now, I, you know, I, those of you that have been around here, you know that I've been suggesting for several years now or two or three years anyway, you know, s- s- you know, the, re- the need to rediscover some of the first century tools of interpretation. In fact, in my well, not not the last one, but in the ex- extreme makeover series, I think the very first tape in that or very first teaching in that rather was was uh, interpretational guidelines. And, and I was really breaking the breaking this breaking into this with that particular message. OK. But but these are adjustments that are necessary if we're going to process his truth and his reasonings. And so we've got to make some adjustments. You know, I remember years ago when we were clear, I think we were clear out on Blue Spruce. For those of you who don't, don't know what that means, we used to be in a building out there. And, and, and Arthur was here and he taught a lesson and, and he, he taught it. I'm going to be using this scripture next week, but, uh, but probably not going to say everything he said about it. But just in, I think it's in John 6 where, where, where uh, Jesus says, glorify yourself. He said, I have glorified myself I w- and I will glorify myself again. Anyway, the voice comes out of heaven. Some people think it's thunder. Some people think it's the... It's the uh, it's the angel speaking, right? And the whole basic thing that I'm going to play off of here is that, is that we hear, and I believe this is kind of what Arthur taught too, we hear in the language we're accustomed to hearing. Yeah, in fact, he was teaching on hearing the language of love, hearing in the language of love. I remember that now. And, and you know, we hear, you know, in the, in the language we're accustomed to hearing. So in other words, if God speaks and says, if you're willing and obedient and you're a legalistic hearer, that's what you hear, Right? But if, but if God says, if you're willing and obedient and you realize that you are going to obey what you heard and hearken to it in order, you know what I'm saying? There's a different way you hear that. See what I'm saying? So anyway, as I said, these are, these are adjustments that need to be made in order for us to be able to hear his truth. I want you, I want you to be able to hear him. I don't want you to be able to hear me. Or Bertie, or Arthur, or Francois Dutoy, or, or 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 Caleb, or John. I want you to hear him through us, and I want you to know when it's not him through us. Even if we, remember those of you that have been in Galatians, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel, let him be accursed. So even if I divert because I just can't get you people under control, I can't get you to give enough. Even if I divert and just step, take one step backwards and say, listen, this is what you got to do in order to be blessed. You got to tithe in order to be blessed. Even if we said, just let Mike go ahead and live under that old cursed thought if he wants to. See, you getting it? So I want you to learn to hear the voice. So, so there are some things that have to take place, some changes that must take place in your, in your, uh, in your understanding. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Wow, here he is on the fourth scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. I might just come up with another one just to throw you off. I don't know. Again, all of these are scriptures you're familiar with. I'm not familiar with where 2 Timothy is in my Bible, but here we go. Turn to verse 15. Be diligent or steady, the King James says, right? So that means get your strongs out. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A lot can be said about that. Again, you know, this is one of the things that Arthur showed me years ago that I really appreciate. It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. In other words, get into the Word so that you can show yourself from the Word of God that you are already approved by God, that you were approved by God in the Lord Jesus. That's not what I want to focus on, but that was a major uh, player in my life. And so he says, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. See, there's no need for you to be ashamed. Not because of something that you did. Not because you studied enough, you don't need to be ashamed. What the scripture wants to show you is that you don't need to be ashamed because he has removed all shame. He has removed all guilt. He has removed all condemnation. See, he that believeth in me shall not be ashamed. He that believeth in me shall not be disgraced. See? All right. So anyway, he's telling you this. When you get into the word, this is the way you should see the word. You should see the word projecting you as one who is approved by God, who has no need to be ashamed. Isn't that good news? But then he goes on here and he, tell, and he tells you what you're doing when you see it that way. He says, you are rightly dividing the word of truth. This is the thing I wanted to focus on. And again, I've talked about this before. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The word dividing here, first of all, comes from a root word. The root word is orthos. O-R-T-H-O-S. Orthos. Uh, and that refers to being, now listen to me, 
perpendicularly upright and horizontally level, right? Now, perpendicular means what? It means to be at a right angle to the horizontal, all right? Keep that in mind because we're going to use that in just a moment, all right? Now, the word dividing itself, the actual word dividing, I said it came from a root word, orthos. The word dividing is orthotomeo, and it means to make a straight cut, to dissect accurately the vertical and the horizontal, right? The vertical and the horizontal. In other words, not confusing the thought and the language of one with the other, which we do consistently and have been taught to do. Isn't that right? Now, the writers of the New Covenant, they navigated the vertical and the horizontal with ease. They had no problems with it because they had these tools, see? But we've lost the tools. We've misplaced the tools. We don't know how to do that anymore. And so so what we do is we interpret the vertical by the horizontal. We interpret the horizontal. You know, we don't interpret the horizontal. I mean, we just got it all confused. And so here's what he's saying. Now, as I said, it means to, to make a straight cut to dissect accurately the vertical and the horizontal. Now, I said that perpendicular means to be at a right angle with the horizontal. Now, what is a right angle? 90 degrees, right? Not 89, not 91, right? 90. I mean, I'm just off a degree either way. Listen, if I hang a picture and it's off a degree, she she finds out. Did you get the level? I don't need a level. I can see that. Straight to, straight to me. <laughs> I hung wallpaper one time in Caleb's bedroom when he was in high school. Notre Dame wallpaper. Good stuff. Stuff we put money on, you know. I walked in that room and I thought, well, that's not perpendicular with the floor. <laughs> it was, I couldn't change it. It was already stuck. I didn't have enough to go back. So he always had to kind of look at that one section. <laughs> that's why I didn't go into, you know, kind of things that, you know, Daniel and these guys do. I said, I better stick with preaching. I can't do anything else very well. But anyway, but he's telling us here, you know, that we need to learn to rightly divide. So as I said, 90 degrees is a right angle. 89 and 91 are not perpendicular. However, they are not discernible to the naked eye, are they? You know what I'm saying? They're not discernible to the naked eye. They're only one degree off. But what did Paul say twice? A little leaven leavens the whole lump if i just add a little bit or take away you know what i i know that in in the bet and here's the sad thing about it in in the best case scenario we have been educated in an 87 to 93 degree theology now most of us where we came from was anywhere from 60 to 120 right but now we've closed down the gap a little bit you know we're 87 and 93 a little bit of take away a little bit of add to you know but, but, but we can handle this i mean you really can't see it well, you can see it in the lives of people. Did you know you can see that one degree in the lives of people? I don't mean that we're going around picking on people. I don't mean it that way. You know, I mean that you can see it the evidenced in their lives. I, I know it. See, when, when, my, when the evidence of my own life is not what I, I, I understand from the finished work of Jesus Christ, I know I'm either 89 or 91. I'm only 66, by the way, but I may look 89 or 91. But you see what I'm saying? We, we, we really must understand how important this is. I mean, how, how, how precisely important the Holy Spirit was being here when he said rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dissecting the horizontal with the, with the, with the vertical truths, rightly taking the human experience and intersecting it with, with the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not off a little here, not off a little. See, if it, if it leans to, to, the, to the left a little bit, you know, it leans to that 89% side, well, you've got to incorporate a little bit of law. It's like I told you, see, I was nearly perpendicular with the message I was hearing in Bible school. You don't have to do anything to be healed. You don't have to do anything to be saved. You don't have to do anything to be delivered. But you must tithe in order to be blessed. See, that's a little 89%, see, 89 degree thing. But you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that brought me back to 90%. The grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for my sake he became poor, that I through his poverty might become rich. See what I'm saying? Well, there's all kinds of that kind of stuff. Just a little bit of law. Just need to add a little bit of law. Just 1% law or 1 degree law, I mean. That's not even a percent. All right, so anyway. So we need the thoughts of God to correct the cut, if you will. Isn't that right? We need the thoughts of God. In other words, God's reasoning entering our reasoning at precisely 90 degrees. 
Now, we've got to realize this, too. Now, those of you that haven't been around here, I can recommend you go back and talk, listen to some other things later on. But, but you know, we, we have this vertical and this horizontal, and the vertical is everything that God has done through Christ Jesus and, and is finished in behalf of man, all right? And the horizontal is the human experience. But here's the thing. We've got to realize that God's work, which is the vertical. Now, listen to me carefully. God's work, which is the vertical, describes accurately the human condition and experience, which is the horizontal. It describes it accurately. I'm going to say that again. You've got to get this. The vertical or the work of God describes accurately the human condition and experience. It's not the other way around. Let me say it like this. By his stripes, you were healed. That is an accurate description of the of the physical condition of man. See? And, a, and of his experience. That's, the, that's an accurate definition of it. Hmm. Until we accept that, until we believe that, until we will go with that and say, look, this is the accurate description and definition. It, we, we, can't, we cannot go back and say, well, yeah, yes, but. Sister so-and-so passed away of cancer and she was only 33 years old and blah, 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 blah. And she was a believer, read her Bible, prayed, fasted, gave to the church, blah, 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 blah. See, we can't go back and do that. We can't go back and say, this is not the true representation. This is not the representation of truth because of what happened here. See? And so the vertical, I want you to hear this now. The vertical defines the who and the quality. The whom and the quality. The whom is all, Right? The quantity and the quality. The vertical defines it. What God has said is all. All men. That's what God said. He said all men. God was in Christ reconciling the whole world to himself. See, God was in Christ doing that. Right? Now there's a horizontal. We beseech you now. Be reconciled unto God. But here's the thing. The vertical defines the quantity and the quality. The quantity is this word all. The quality is this word perfect, perfection. And Caleb's got some things to say about that, so I won't go on any further with that. But quality and quantity, all and perfect. See, that's the vertical, and that is the, is the correct, the accurate definition of man's condition and his experience, regardless of what we see. The horizontal simply reveals man's understanding of the vertical. Isn't that right? See, my life was all up and down with disease until I began to understand the vertical. And then it began, my, the, the horizontal began to reveal more and more of my understanding of the vertical. Still not perfect, still haven't gotten it all worked out, you know what I'm saying? But now I understand this so that, so that the horizontal doesn't throw me off anymore. But religion has been defining the vertical by the horizontal practically from the beginning. Haven't they? Right. In other words, we have been assigning thoughts and ways to God based on the evident truth of man's experience. Well, God doesn't always heal. See, we've assigned that to God. All right. One vital adjustment, you know, that's got to be made is in our point of origination with regard to our our assumptions about Elohim. I'm going to say Elohim right now. Uh, Because I want to emphasize Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, from the very beginning. But anyway, I'll I'll go on and say God. But every time I say God now, I'm I'm referring to Elohim. I'm referring to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But but as I said, one vital adjustment that's got to be made is in the point of origination of our assumptions about God and our relational connection with Him. Now, I want you to think about it, honestly with me. Where have we had our formal introduction to God? Okay. And where did we first develop our premise of relational truth? After the fall. Isn't that right? The first thing that greeted me in that little Lutheran church where I went to to a, a vacation Bible school in the summer when I was about five years old was for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. See, that's where we were. This is where we were introduced to God. It was after the fall. So here's a problem, you know, in Genesis three, and you're going to have to listen to me carefully now. I I wrote this down because I know what I want to say, and I'm hoping that I'm going to communicate it accurately. But in Genesis three, we've been introduced to God who, after an eternity of unchanging character, right? I mean, he's from everlasting, right? So even to that point, we could say that was eternity, 
So after an eternity of no variableness or shadow of change, of him always being absolutely the same in every aspect of his being, after an eternity of that, now in Genesis 3, he has something foreign on his plate, something that's never been there before, something foreign on his plate, man's sin, right? And that requires, but it requires only a slight improvision of agenda in his interaction with his sons. Now, I'm speaking truth to you right now. So let me say this again. I want you to get this. We're introduced to God in Genesis 3, who after an eternity of unchanging character, has something foreign now on his plate that requires on his part only a slight improvision of agenda in his interaction with his son. See, it's slight and it's only temporary from an accurate point of origin, but something that we've allowed to become huge and imagined to be permanent because of our doctrine. This, this change that took place, right? In other words, we've been generally introduced to God in an infinitely small segment of the eternity that accurately describes his relational character. So we have, if, if we could open up the halls of eternity and read them correctly, we would see from everlasting to everlasting the true revelation of the relational character of God, wouldn't we? But what we've seen is this infinitely small picture when God undertook something very unusual to his character, very, un, 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 you know, what do I say? Unusual, that's a good word. So, and here's the thing, and we haven't been told that because he's the only one with the ability to fix the momentary lapse in his children's condition, let me, let me back up on that. See, here's what we've been told. The law is about you fixing what's wrong with you, right? See what I'm saying? We've been told that your obedience plays on fixing you. So we haven't been told that because he is the only one with the ability to fix this momentary, and I'm emphasizing these words because I want you to get the smallness of it. I want you to get the smallness of what we see in Genesis chapter 3 until the resurrection of Christ. Itty bitty. Everybody say itty bitty. Itty bitty. Itty bitty. Okay, that's good. You got the itty bitty thing, okay? So he's the only one with the ability to fix this momentary lapse in his children's condition. So he cheerfully not angrily, cheerfully, added an agenda of rescue to his usual activity. You see, his usual activity didn't include that from eternity. There was no rescue necessary because there was nothing foreign on his plate, just this perfect harmony, this perfect relational nature being on display all the time as he and the Son and the Spirit, you know, were enjoying one another. And as I've told you before, I believe maybe, maybe hundreds or even thousands of years actually would have transpired were time being kept between the time that he breathed life into Adam and the time that Adam fell. I don't believe it was the next day. See what I'm saying? I believe there was relationship that had developed. I believe that there was intimacy that had developed. I can't imagine, you know, Caleb going home today and punishing Dylan for something that, you see what I'm saying? But, but I tell you what, I know his other boys, and I can imagine them being punished from time to time. <laughs> now that they've had a little chance to grow up, you know what I'm saying? All right, well, anyway, you know, we, we, I think we read things into Scripture that aren't there, and I'm, so I'm going to read some things in that I believe should be there. And that is that it's been all this time for God's true nature relational nature is what I'm talking about, to be, to be you know, accurately described. And now we've got this little bitty window into something that's abnormal. So, and, and from this tiny glimpse of unusual, uncharacteristic action, we have what? Built our God. Isn't that right? So this incorrect point of origination has contaminated our perception of reality so that we therefore now do what? We describe a legal God, a God of perpetual justice, a judiciary figure in our lives. That's what God is to most people. He is a judiciary figure in their life. More concerned about their obedience, their behavior, their performance than he is about anything else. See, that's how we now be. And we got this from this little bitty glimpse into the unusual, <laughs> uncharacteristic activity of God in order to mediate, you know, a, a final result, right? So, so rather than recognizing that these, you know, perpetual justice, judiciary thing, rather than recognizing that these descriptions represent not who he is, but merely a brief addition to his usual activity, 
See, while he alone, and I told you this a couple weeks ago, while he alone mediated, you know, a, 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 a final settlement. Remember, he's both sides of the mediation. He's God in the flesh, and he's God in the spirit. <clears throat> now, consequently, these inappropriate conceptual tools have given faulty definitions. And this is another thing you need to hear, because going forward, you're going to need some of this. This is kind of like my introduction to the last series when I talked about basic interpretational guidelines. I'm doing kind of the same thing because I want you to get this as we go forward. But these inappropriate conceptual tools that we've been using have given faulty definitions to terms that were intended to reveal his deep relational bond with humanity. Now, let me give you some of these terms that were intended by God to reveal his deep and abiding relational bond with all of humanity. Holy, righteous, sanctified, saved, saints. Judgment. I've commented several times on saints recently. The word just means sacred ones. I mean, who is sacred to God? All of humanity. See? But we think saints are the church people. Now, there is a difference between the church and the world right now. I'm not, I'm not saying there's not. Okay? But, but, but all of these words were words that were in, intended to communicate his intimate relationship with man. Even repentance. What is repentance? I mean, truly, repentance means what? Think differently. So what is that? That's simply a call back to Isaiah 118. Come now, let us reason together so that you can think differently. And my kindness will lead you to come now so that we can... See what I'm saying? The kindness of God leads men to repentance, doesn't it? Leads men to come to reason with the Father so He can, allow, can promote an understanding in you that will allow you to eat the good of the land. See, all of these things are about relational communication. They're not judiciary. <laughs> They're not legal. But that's what we have because we have this little dinky glimpse into, into who he is, right? Now, now, I've said this to you before, and you've got to get it. With the Father, because of Jesus, it's as though the fall never happened. You've got to let that sink in, folks. Three times in complete, in complete statement and one time implied in Romans. Once in Jeremiah 31, once in Hebrews 8, once in Hebrews uh, 10, and also in Romans 11, the incomplete statement. God said that under the new covenant, I will remember no more. I will remember no more. What is he not going to remember anymore? The fall. The fall of man and everything associated with it. So with God, because of Christ, it's as if the fall never happened. Only in the church is it as if the fall ever happened. Amen. <clears throat> so let, let me ask you that. Now, if you can embrace that as true, how does that affect, you know, our thoughts and our reasonings? Well, immediately, think about that. If the fall never happened, right, how's that going to affect our thoughts and our reasonings? First thing it does, it removes all exclusionary clauses of divine origination. What do I mean by that? I mean, see, all of the things that we have said have attributed to God as reasons that he would exclude men. Man excludes himself. I'm not saying he doesn't. Man, man can, can be, you know, can exclude himself from the benefit. I'm not, I'm not saying he doesn't. But the first thing this does is if the fall never happened, think, think it through, folks. If the fall never happened, there are no exclusionary clauses from God's side, are there? If you don't, you won't. If you do, you will. You know what I'm saying? There's none of that. It's all gone. See, Jesus went back and became Adam. What's that tell us? That he took man back before the fall. He came to fulfill Adam's obedience, as we talked about in our faith series. He came back and fulfilled Adam's obedience, fulfilled Adam's, you know, operated in Adam's, in the, I mean, perfected Adam's faith, so that he was taking humanity back before the fall. So it's as though the fall never happened. All right, so immediately I said it removes all the exclusionary clauses that might be of divine origin because it means that fallen Adamic nature is no more. Therefore, sin and the law are non-existent, irrelevant conditions, considerations, I mean, in the vertical plane of his action. Yes, there is sin between you and I. Yes, there is a missing the mark in relationships here. Right. And that's what all the sin that is referred to in that context in the New Testament is referring to our activities with one another. OK. But it means that. See, it means that there's no Adamic nature. There's no there's no more sin in law. They're non-existent considerations. You shouldn't be even thinking about them. Right. On the vertical plane. So so now that 
Adam, sin, and the law. Now, listen to me carefully because, again, I'm still trying to speak into the, to the ideas of those who are saying, who are opposing, you know, out of their ignorance. Again, they're good people. I'm not trying to call them by name. But anyway, but, but these things, Adam, sin, and the law can be deemed essential concepts only in the thoughts of men who have formulated their relational understanding from a faulty premise beginning in Genesis 3, 8, in other words. See, those things, that, that's the only way those things can be even considered viable. Now, I want you to consider this. If you can just imagine for me, take the smallest, I can't remember what the weights are, you know, but the, 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 the thinnest, the thinnest uh, uh, fishing leader, and let's, we'll, we'll just say it's strung from that wall to that wall, and what we're going to call that is from everlasting to everlasting. It's a little bitty thing that even with the lights on, you might not see it running behind my head if we strung it from wall to wall. Okay, it's small. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, the line of eternity, right? Now, you take that, and of course, it needs to extend on past the wall and on past that wall, and it needs just to keep on going anyway. But if you can picture that from everlasting to everlasting... Right. And then you can position the entire human history of man. If I can take a, a pin. I don't know if I got a small enough point. I don't have to find enough point. If I can take a pin and I can take the whole entire history of man and I can put it on that line. It would not even be a discernible dot to you from out there. Right. Yeah. You wouldn't even be able to see it. Can't even. I know he put it on there. Where is it? See. It would not even be a discernible dot. Isn't that right? See? So let me ask you this. Why then would we form our relational beliefs and our expectations on the even smaller period of time that was the fallen era? I've just put the entire history of humanity, including, you know, the, however long Adam was here before the fall and, 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 and since the resurrection of Christ is on there too. But if we just take out that period, you see, that was the fallen era, I mean, why in the world would we build our beliefs and expectations on an infinitesimally small, something so small, it can't even be discerned? Are we so petty? Do we think, I mean, do we think God is so petty that from everlasting to everlasting is negated by something that can't even be seen? With him, it says it never existed. See what I'm saying? So we were intended to begin our revelation of relational reality from the resurrection of Christ with no backward thought, with no rearward considerations. I want you to get that again. We, the church, the body of Christ, okay, the world, I mean, I should say, you know, was intended to begin our revelation of relational reality from the resurrection of Christ with no backward thought, with no rearward considerations. And this is why, another thing I've stressed a lot around here, this is why recognizing transitional writing to a transitional generation is such a vital conceptual tool. Understanding that much of what we read in the New Testament scriptures was, 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 was written to people who had lived on the other side of the cross and were now being updated into a new lifestyle, and these things were to be left behind. When he says new, Hebrews 8.13, when he says new, what he calls new, he has made the old obsolete. And what he has made obsolete is fading away, passing away, and ready to be released, basically. I'm kind of paraphrasing. But see what he was telling the Hebrew people? He was telling them, look, you know, you're in a transition right now, you people. You were Old Testament people. You were dead. You were dead in Adamic nature. But now you're alive in the Christ nature. See? But anyway, so these things, I'm saying that we weren't to have any backward consideration. And, but see, so much of what we've brought forward and, and included in our, in our thought, in our language process in the church was delivered to the first generation not as a rearward consideration but as a forward relocation assurance. In other words, saying you were, but now you are, right? But sadly, we've latched on to their experience. We've brought it forward with us to where we now are still telling people that man is still until he becomes, right? We keep saying that kind of thing. And that's what's bound up in the heart of these confused people that are having difficulty with some of the new revelation. That's, and again, it's not new. It's just revelation that's resurfacing that was, that was suppressed by legalism, right? But here's the thing. So we've erroneously embraced their experience in a way that says men still are until they become. And folks, that thinking corrupts the vertical. 
Think about that. It corrupts the vertical and it robs the horizontal of hope. All right, so this is only a beginning. But even this, I know, is going to require some new thought and reasoning to become clear to you. But I promise you, as Paul said, a great and effective door is open to you. And there are many adversaries, but the good of the land awaits you. Do you think of that? Amen. Amen. Amen.